Take a paper clip and bend it so you have two distinct points and place it around different areas of your body. You'll find that on some areas, like your bicep, you can only sense one point. And on my elbow, I could also only sense one point. But on my lips and my fingertip, I can easily discriminate two points. Now the reason I'm able to do that is not only because that part is more sensitive, but also because of how a specific part of my brain is mapped out and organized. And where can we find that part? You guessed it, your parietal lobe. All right, guys, welcome to Psych Explained. In this video, we're going to discuss the parietal lobe, where it's located, what it does, and what happened if there was damage to this region. So let's get started. Now, the first thing to do is to identify where the parietal lobe is located in relation to the other lobes of the cerebral cortex, the frontal, the temporal, and the occipital lobe. Now, I've talked about this in other videos. Some of the lobes are easier to identify than others because of these defined borders and boundaries. For example, the occipital lobe, located in the back of the brain, is harder to identify because there really aren't any grooves or crevices. You almost have to use an imaginary dotted line to let me know where it is. But the parietal lobe is easier to identify because you really have two big boundaries that let me know where it is. Those two include this line, we call this the central sulcus, and this line, we call that the lateral sulcus. Now, before you go any further, let's understand what I mean by sulcus, okay? Because I've talked about this in other videos. You know when you close your eyes and you visualize the brain and the cortex is really wrinkled? In fact, I'll draw it right here, right? Here's our, the, the top of the brain, right? Here's our cerebral cortex, okay? Now, what do I mean by sulcus? Well, these grooves, right, these indentations, okay, that you see right here, these are what we call the sulcus, okay? So these are the sulcus, okay? Or if you want to say it plural, sulci. And then the bumps on top that are right here, right, these little big bumps right here, these bumps are what we call the gyrus, or if you want to say it plural, gyri. Okay, so going forward, not just this video, but in a lot of discussions, the grooves are called the sulcus and the bumps are called the gyrus. Okay, that's just good knowledge to have. So this would be the sulcus, so this would be the indentation, and so would this. And what this lets me know is that the parietal lobe is located just behind or posterior to the central sulcus. So this would be our, right in together, parietal, parietal lobe, okay? and that the prior lobe would be just above the lateral sulcus. So we had our frontal lobe in front of the central sulcus, and we have our temporal lobe just below the lateral sulcus. Okay? And of course, our occipital lobe is back here. So that's a nice way to think about the division and boundaries of the brain. Now, why is the prior lobe important? It's important because it houses the biggest and largest receptive area of the body, a part called the somatosensory, out of sensory cortex, okay? And this, let's actually break this down, okay? When I say the word soma or somata, right? This means body, okay? This means body, right? So if we're studying the neuron, right? The big cell body is called the soma, right? We can kind of make a connection there. So what we're saying is this part of your parietal lobe takes in sensory information, sensory information from your body to receive it and process it. All right, so where's our, our somatosensory cortex located? Well, it's located just behind our central sulcus, all right, on the gyrus, right? It's kind of like this little strip, which I can draw here. Here would be our, our gyrus, here's our bump, okay? And this would be our somatosensory cortex, okay? So right here, that's you know, nice, easy to identify. And then if we think about the frontal lobe, our motor cortex would be located right in front of the sulcus, right here, okay? So that's a nice way to think about the parietal lobe. So when we think about the function of the parietal lobe, you think about its main function in relation to what it houses, which is the somatosensory cortex. So what is its primary function? It receives and processes sensory information from the body. Okay, so we will talk later on 
that lobe has several functions, but this is the main one. It houses the somatosensory cortex and receives and processes sensory information from the body. Now, this region is also part of a larger system, what we call the somatosensory system, right? This helps register changes both outside and inside the body, right? Outside the body might be changes to my skin, right? Feeling temperature, cold and hot and pain. And inside my body might be like moving my muscles. So let's actually think about how information is received in the parietal lobe. We'll talk about that both externally and internally. All right, so let's start with external. So externally, we have things like temperature, right? These are things that your body's taking in, things that are hot and cold, okay? Hot and cold. We also have pressure, right? Different parts of touch, right? So if I squeeze my skin, right, that would be pressure. We have texture. If I was touching something smooth or rough, bumpy, right, that would be texture. We also have pain. Right, that's kind of our big one, right? This would be a different pathway to the brain, but maybe sticking a needle, getting a shot of something like that. We also have things like shape and size, okay? Shape and size. And what I mean by that is, you know, as I'm holding these markers, right, and I close my eyes, I'm able to feel how smooth it is, how much it weighs, you know, everything about it. So I'm not only understanding what it feels like, but I'm also connecting it to my memory to know what it is. And lastly, our sensory cortex is picking up things like weight, right? Imagine picking up something very heavy, right? And you have to know how hard to lift. Well, my somatosensory cortex is gonna help me with that as well. So this would be kind of our external sensory receptors taking in information. So what would be an internal receptor, right? What would be something that's internal that would eventually reach the parietal lobe? Well, this would be something that we've talked about in other videos called proprio, proprio receptors proprioreceptors, okay? And these are sensor receptors attached to our muscles, our ligaments, and our joints that relate to the parietal lobe and let me know if I'm lifting, if I'm punching, if I'm, if I'm going down, if I'm doing exercises, that would be something internally, all right? So we have our external receptors and our internal receptors. And let's actually visualize what this would look like reaching the parietal lobe. Imagine it's a nice summer day and all of a sudden a mosquito lands on your arm, all right? Do you like my drawing of mosquito? Now, you don't know it's a mosquito at first, right? All you know is that something's there. You have all these action potentials firing. And the sensory information, right, from our sensory neurons, right, this would be from the external world, are going to travel from our peripheral nervous system to our central nervous system, right, travel up through our brainstem and our medulla, right? This is where it's going to crisscross and travel to the opposite hemisphere. We've talked about that. If this is on, the, let's say, the right side, Right, this would be facing you. It's gonna to travel to the opposing hemisphere. And where it's gonna to go to first is our thalamus, right? And that's where it's gonna synapse with another neuron, right? No synapse with another neuron there. And then from there, it's gonna to head to our parietal lobe, specifically our somatosensory cortex. This whole region represents our cortex, and we could shade it in. So all of this. All of this represents our somatosensory cortex, registering touch and pressure and pain and everything we talked about before, right? All, think about how big this region is, right? A huge region, okay? So here's something to think about. Does information from specific parts of my body, like my arm or my toes or my knees, go to specific areas of my somatosensory cortex? And the answer, it does. How do we know this? Well, if I stimulate one region, for example, I you know, stimulate the top region, I might feel some weird tingling in my knee. Or if I stimulate this region over here, maybe I feel some weird sensation in my fingers. Or if I stimulate this region here, maybe my tongue starts to feel weird. And essentially what we're doing is we formed a map of my somatocentric cortex, a neurological map. So if I take this region here and I copy paste it over here, we're kind of looking at it at a different angle. And we find is that the area of the cortex is devoted not to the size of the body part. If that was the case, the majority would be devoted to my back. But based on how sensitive that part is, right? How much, you know, densely packed that area is with neurons. So for example, my lips and my tongue and my hands have more space on the somatosensory cortex than areas that aren't really sensitive, like my back and my elbow. 
And we demonstrated that with my little two-point discrimination test with my paperclip. You could try that at home. If we could visualize this again, right, here's another visual of our, of our somatosensory cortex, both on our left hemisphere and our right hemisphere. We can almost, you know, visualize it, you know, I feel like this is kind of like a pie chart. Like this much region, right, might be devoted to my face, right, my tongue, my nose, right, very sensitive. But we just have a very little region, you know, maybe devoted to my elbow, right, because it's not very sensitive. But we have a big region, you know, located right here, let's say, for example, that's devoted to my toes and other sensitive parts. So it's based on the sensitivity, not the size. That's a nice way to think about it. So besides receiving and processing sensory information, what else does my parietal lobe do? Well, we know it does other things because when there's damage to that region, we see differences in people's behavior. And one of them is that it helps with spatial orientation. Okay, spatial orientation. So for example, if I'm reaching out to reach for a glass of water, right? My ability to know how far away the glass is, how, how far to reach, is helped and aided by my parietal lobe. In other words, if there is damage, instead of spatial orientation, I would have spatial disorientation. So judging depth, knowing where my limbs are, how far to reach out, that would be spatial orientation. I also know that it helps with language, okay? Now we typically think of language like our Broca's area and things like that, but it also helps with language. Specifically things like reading and writing and identifying symbols and other things like that. And there is an area of your brain in the parietal lobe called the angular gyrus, that's right here. It's kind of this triangle structure that helps with reading and language and those processes. And when there's damage to this reading, you might be able to think of a word, but might not be able to get that word out. And that's how we know there's other functions other than just receiving and processing sensory information. Guys, thanks for watching. I really hope you took something away. I'd recommend find a paper clip at home, bend it, get two points, and stick it around different areas of your body. It's not only fun, but you'll also learn about sensory receptors and of course the somatosensory cortex. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe. I'll see you next time.